So given how heavy and personal my last Living With The Boys video was, or based, as some of you young'uns like to say with all your funny modern words and mood-dependent genitals, I'm sure there's one probing question you really want to know the answer to. When PJ kept saying, Don't worry about it, it'll be grand. Was it actually grand? Well, put it this way. These days, I trust the PJ's it'll be grand as much as I'd trust Eddie Murphy's withdrawal method. Now, don't get me wrong, I love the man. He is to my life what a forgotten balled up pocket tissue is to somebody who's accidentally sneezed a lump of sad phlegm into the palm of their existence. But when it comes to planning, time management, or general organisation, well, like my old art teacher used to say to me, Ducky, that table didn't wobble before you sat at it. Which didn't make a whole lot of sense to me at the time, but I get it now. PJ is the guy at the factory who didn't measure one of the legs properly. PJ makes my desk wobble. Wait, what I'm trying to say is, he didn't really treat those aspects of his life with any level of urgency. You know those stories of people who spontaneously combust in their chair at like the age of 80 and all that's found is ash, soot and a pair of reading glasses and nobody can explain why they suddenly burst into flames? That's not a mystery. That's just people like PJ who actually died in a house fire 40 years ago but they're just getting around to it now. So what it'll be grand actually means coming from him is, whatever happens, we won't die. Probably. I mean, I do love his lax attitude with most things. It can be a great diffuser for morale getting a little bit too high strung and pedanting in ourselves with things, you know? He can really lower the tempo a bit. But the problem with being that laid back is, occasionally one of us will trip over him. Thankfully for this video's sake, I hadn't quite figured that out yet when we made the trip to Cork that night. But I did after. Now, you've been an internet viewer in the 2020s, there's a good chance that your memory of that video has already been overwritten by whatever that horrible noise is Pitbull makes and deep fakes of the smoke show from Harry Potter that is, Professor McGonagall. So not to worry, I'll give you a quick recap of part one. So after being temporarily banned from our local pub to give the other fellas a chance, five of us piled into a car, cans in hand, and hit the road for the big small city of Cork. Would have been six of us, but one of us had the trots. <coughs> Subscribe for more dad jokes. Honestly, I don't think I can stop. We accidentally parked a car on top of a mountain just outside the city, entrusted the big Lebowski with sorting out that night's accommodation, and stumbled across somebody who not only looked surprisingly like me, but was also cheating on my girlfriend. Now, I'd love to tell you that there was more than just a tongue fight that happened with this girl, but you know what women are like. Soon as she got what she wanted, she receded into the darkness of the night, never to be seen again. So that's the problem with women. They're never after the real connection. They just want one thing, and as soon as they get it, they're going to cast you aside and look for the next bloke with functional fingers. I mean, you can try keeping them around by showing off how well you can please them quickly but they milk every single second out of it and after about 10 minutes you've lost all confidence in your craft your arm has gone dead and even if you do got focus on your side and you're lucky enough not to be overly exposed under all the lights of the club there's still a good chance they won't be pleased and by the end you'll just be left holding a warm pint feeling dirty and used that's why i've stopped agreeing to take their photos for them oh they're predatory with those photos aren't they when they come up to me in a club these days and ask me to take their photo i tell them no means no God gave you a front-facing camera for a reason. I'm trying to enjoy my night with my friends with some adult beverages and sophisticated conversation. And you think you can just come up to me and treat me like I'm a piece of camera equipment? Well, I'm sorry, girl. There's more to this tripod than just my three legs, and you should have better control over your urges. Ugh, why are women such pigs? Also, while speaking to the ladies here, you have a lot to answer for. Because that night in Cork, when I was waiting to use the bathroom, the door to the ladies' bathroom was open. And in there, there was a girl squatting over the sink like something out of Crouching Cougar hidden handbag. And I'll try not to be too descriptive, but I'll say whatever she was washing, it wasn't her hands. No water was a funny colour and all. That has lived rent free in my head ever since. It's completely changed my perception of women's bathrooms. I used to see them as these ethereal paradises with velvet chaise longs and delicate harp music interrupted by a gentle whisper of an offer of a hug, some chocolates and a tampon. But no, that's all a lie. And I don't know why I was surprised by it, because of course your toilets are like a mosh pit. You can't hold your drink as well as us, so you're in there thrown up all over the floors and walls. The clothes you wear take about 45 minutes to get out of just to have a lash. And half your stalls are full of other women in floods of tears because they saw somebody that night wearing the same shoes as them. But I will say, there is a subtle difference with how men and women react coming across somebody having a slash in a sink. Because she wasn't interrupted. Not a comment, not a complaint, not a single bouncer tackled her to the floor in a flurry of thumps and splashes. It was like it wasn't actually happening. If something like that happened in the men's bathroom, at least we'd react on some level. Ah, uh, come on, man, for f**k's sake, like, other people have to use that too, you know. Who raised you at all? Now, what you want me to do, I was bursting and you were taking ages. Yeah, but you have to take over the whole thing. No water so people can wash their hands. So, a while later, while I'm standing at the bar waiting for a drink, PJ comes running up to me and he's like, Lad, give me a hand over here, will ya? Why? What's up? One of the boys was chatting up a girl and her boyfriend come over and told him to f**k off. Right. Well, he's after taking offence to being told to f**k off, and now he's squaring up to him and it looks like it's going to be a fight. Really? 
Who would feel like the victim for being told to stop flirting with their girlfriend? Like they're in the wrong there. Like that makes absolutely no sense. It's Tony, isn't it? Yep. God damn it, Tony! So we find this guy and Tony still arguing outside the pub after being kicked out by the bouncers for yipping at each other. And we realise that there's a problem. This lad isn't on his own. He's four other lads with him. All of them perfectly identical, which is really strange. I remember saying to PJ, you know if I was to ever retell this story through the medium of animation, I don't think people would believe me that they all look the same. They probably think it's some sort of corner cutting measure. But they're not identical, lad. What are you talking about? All their shirts are different to start. And just look at their- Shut the fuck up. Now, a big gang of rival lads weren't usually a worry for us. Yeah, none of us were really fighters, but with alcohol-fueled courage and decent numbers, we could easily accidentally knock the phone out of somebody's hand in a scrap. And nobody wants to risk having to replace an experience expensive phone so we rarely had to deal with any conflict. But the problem here was, 20 minutes ago we decided to head to another spot and we sent Connor and Hef on ahead to scope the place out and make sure it wasn't so packed we'd have to molest half the club just to get within spitting distance of the bar. So now we're going to have to defend Tony, even though we have no clue how capable we are in a fight, we both think he's in the wrong. And worst of all, we're quite outnumbered. Not that Tony thought it through, mind you. He was squaring up to all five of them even before we arrived. So worried having our heads caved in might upset the vibe of the night, we head over to try talk down Tony before the handbags start swinging. But Tony Tony has been slamming drinks all night and can't see any reason why he couldn't take on five guys in an unfamiliar city on his own. And he's not listening to a word we're saying and is refusing to back down. And now that we've made our presence known, his mate's ears perk up and now we're getting actively involved in the whole thing. So PJ gets them apart and tries to talk down Tony while I go over and try keep things calm with the guy's friends, one of which I'm talking to starts shaking my hand. Now I'm no idiot, I know the whole I'm gonna shake your hand and then sucker punch you technique, so I'm ready for it if it comes. But for now all that's been thrown is words, and if that is his plan he's unlikely to do anything until things things kick off. So I'm trying to be diplomatic and upfront with the guy. I apologise to him for all the drama that's happening, I tell him we're well aware that Tony's the one being bang out of order, and I'm all round just doing my best to try take it from a 9 all the way down to a reasonable 4. The problem is, this guy is still shaking my hand, and it's gone way past the acceptable length of a handshake. I was already anticipating a possible soccer punch, now he's trying to extend the handshake for as long as he can, and on top of that, Tony is still being a dick and not seeing sense, so my patience is really starting to run out. So I say it to the lad. Are you feeling alright there lad, this handshake is getting a bit weird. As I pull my hand away I look at him and I begin to notice something. His eyes are vibrating like that back massager the missus keeps in the drawer. Pupils dilated looking at me like a self-conscious lover would when they've presented you with their bare chest exposing their oversized areola. A look of intensity, fear and possibly violence is the wrong answer. And he's sweating like he's just been from the toilet after having one of those end of relationship fights with his bowels but they've stayed together because he promised he'll never go near cheese again. And I'm thinking to myself. I know that look from somewhere. You alright lad? You're looking a bit shook. Oh sh**. No no snow. So it goes from I might get sucker punched to f knows what's going on in his hokey cokey mind. So I run over to PJ and I say, hey lad, I think one of them is on drugs. Yeah, the whole lot of them are. We need to get moving. And he was dead right. They were all looking a bit jittery. So not wanting to headline in the main event of the MDMMA, myself and PJ came up with the perfect plan to convince Tony to walk away, leaving all three of us safe and sound. It was ingenious too. It was a little technique we called the rear naked choke. Yeah, we just dragged him away kicking and screaming. Was either that or get our teeth booted in. I know some people would say we could have just left them, but that's not how a gang of boys operates. You can rescue them or you can fight and you can save your disagreements for the peace talks. So we meet back up with the boys and continue our night. In the absence of anything interesting happening after that, we'll jump forward to the end of the night. All the pubs and clubs of the night are closed and myself and Connor are sitting down in a takeaway, chowing down on some fast food. And by fast food I'm talking about the speed in which it'll come out of you the following day. Really was fast. Ow. You see, we had lost track of the rest of the boys at some stage in the night, and now that the night was drawn to a close, we needed to meet back up with PJ and the boys and find out where we're staying tonight. Problem is, none of them are answering their phones or replying to messages. No big deal, we thought. We'll do a lap or two around the bar area of the city, and surely we'll hear the distant sounds of Tony fighting a bin. Many laps and over an hour later, still no answer on the phones, no replies to the messages, and they're not lost in the crowd because there simply is no crowd anymore. Everybody had rightfully gone home to bed, leaving the city eerily quiet, save only for the sounds of sweeping brushes and footsteps as the street cleaners come out and clear the way through the discarded takeaways and internal organs that have been chucked up all over the city. So with there being no place to go as of yet, and the sounds of her testicles audibly clicking together in the midnight frost, we decided to head back to the car. For all we knew, they were having trouble contacting us and were waiting for us back at the car to guide us to tonight's accommodation, be it a couch or floor or f***ed wheelie bin at this stage. So we start trekking and things go smoothly, for about 10 minutes. But then we get a harsh reminder of something. The f***ing hill. 
Yeah, standing at the bottom of that, looking up, we knew we were going to be scaling that with all the composure of a frustrated father of five assembling an IKEA shelf. The thing was steeper than the rates my missus demands to knock boots. All I'm saying is, how about this time I wear the lingerie? Oh, there's always a catch, isn't there? No deal. And that's a complaint from young, spry, supple, 20-ish year old Ducky. Not old Grizzle makes a noise both standing up and sitting down 33 year old Ducky you're listening to now. And I hope you fellas out there aren't laughing too hard at that either, because it'll sneak up on you too like it did to me. Ugh. Wait, why did I groan? That didn't even hurt. Oh no. Entropy! Oh, I guess my time of silently exiting chairs have passed. I should have cherished them days while I had them. <laughs> Cherished. Oh god, dad jokes. My youth is over. Your youth is what? Over? <laughs> You're old now too. But no, seriously. Between the booze, the questionable food and general exhaustion, that hill was absolute torture. I couldn't honestly tell you how long it took us to get to the top. There was too much blood in my ears to even comprehend time. I just kept climbing, praying for the end, be it to the hill or myself. But eventually, we pushed through and made it all the way to the top. Caught our breath, looked at the car, and there they were. All the boys were waiting for us by the car. They tell us that all their phones had died, so that's why we couldn't get through to any of them. But PJ has not only managed to find us a place to stay for the night, but the house is only a two minute walk from the car, and they have plenty of spare room, so we'll actually be able to sleep in a nice cosy bed for the night. All I could say was, PJ, you beautiful man, I'm going to take up Kegels just for your next Tuesday visit. So there we were, moments later, doubled up in beds, and finally, after all the night shenanigans and exhausting climb, we get to get a well-deserved good night's sleep. Good night, lad. Night, lad. Hey, lad. 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 Lad! Christ, what? You alright there, lad? You dropped there for a second. Huh? Huh? How? Ah, we're still on the f***ing hill. Eventually, we actually make it to the car, and there's no boys. So on our last Hail Mary attempt, we try giving him another call. Hello? Well, lad, where have you been? We've been trying to get through to you for ages. Been asleep, lad. It's like four in the morning, like. Yeah, I know it's four in the f***ing morning. Some of us haven't slept. Never mind. You found us a place to stay, I take it. Eh. Uh, eh? What's eh? Uh, well, a friend is after putting up the tree of us already, like, and there really isn't much room here for anyone else to sleep. So what are we supposed to do? Pitch the tent we don't have? Break out the sleeping bags we didn't bring? Oh, no, wait. Why live like that when we can take a nice long bubble bath in the lovely room of the hotel we didn't book? Sure, look. I'll send you on the address, and I'll have a word with the chap who owns the house, and I'll see if I can talk him into letting you stay. <sighs> right, go on. So after a few minutes we get the address, and guess where it is? Back down the hill and the other side of the city. Roughly about a 45 minute walk. Probably triple that in the knackered state we're in. We both look at each other and f*** that was written all over our faces. We are not walking that distance at this hour of the morning on a wobbly possibility that there might be a kitchen table to sleep on. So we just decided to bite the bullet and sleep in the car. But neither one of us were looking forward to it. It sounds okay in theory, but it was a freezing cold night. Cars hold heat as well as my missus's hands on tossy Thursdays. We weren't exactly in a secluded spot, so there was a good chance it'll draw attention. And both of us had drink in us, so if anybody was to question us, we'd lose all credibility. But we had no choice at this point. So Connor started the car so the heaters of the car could warm us up a bit, and as soon as we were reasonably warm, he shut it off and we turned in for one of the worst night's sleep I had ever gotten in my entire life. Less than an hour later I'm awake again because of the cold. But Connor sleeps like a slot on heroin and has the keys to the car in his pocket, so I don't get the benefit of the car's heater. So I spend the next few hours in a tug of war between my exhaustion and the temperature, constantly dozing off and waking back up to warm up over and over and over again until the sun finally starts to come up and I warm up enough to get a few solid hours in. Suddenly we're awoken by a thump thump thump, and not the good stress relieving Tuesday kind. Guess who it is? No, not the boys. It's the guards. Yep, sent us straight into oh sh** mode. So I wind down the window and try act like I've not just been woken up. Don't know why I did that in hindsight, he would have clearly seen me through the window. And he says to me, Tell me lads, have you been drinking? Now my default setting with dealing with the guards back then was to lie. But before I could get a chance to, I inadvertently moved my feet, which caused all the empty cans that's in the footwell from the previous journey down to clank loudly like some sort of bad sitcom. So to try to get ahead of the drama, we hop out and try to explain to him what had happened and why we were here, which seemed to line up with what he had heard. He got in a report from one of the residents that lived in a house nearby of two suspicious lads in a Honda Civic hanging around the estate attempting to burgle houses. So happy enough that we weren't up to no good and seeing by us that we seemed okay, surprisingly all he said to us was, Go get some breakfast somewhere. I'll be back here in an hour, and I want to see you again. And they took off and left us be. Did those guards seem familiar to you? That's just one of those Pokemon Officer Jenny things, I wouldn't question it. Just appreciate this long ass video. Video? What are you on about? Are you feeling okay, lad? 
Well, my four and a half seconds of sleep in a deep freezer was rudely interrupted by the possibility of being arrested. What do you think? We were 100% sure they'd try to do us for drink driving or something. And it would have been hard to fight that in court given how they came upon us. Needless to say, the relief we felt when they took off would have burst a hymen. So we definitely did exactly what the guards asked and absolutely did not just drive off immediately as soon as they left. We got some much needed grub and coffee and before long we got a phone call from PJ and the rest of the boys. Hello? Well lad, will you be picking us up anytime soon? We're kind of itching to get home like. Yeah lad, of course, don't worry about it. It'll be grand.